to say now, okay. if that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, I am Dr. Sena Dukasa, I'm a family physician, and uh, I work at St. Paul Hospital Millennium Medical College, and I am okay. academic research vice provost at my hospital. So that's all about me. Thank you. Pleased to meet you, uh, Sena. Nice you know what I mean? You. Yeah, I think uh, the introduction goes to Julia. My, na my name is Nuhamin. Uh, I am also a family physician in Ethiopia. I'm currently doing my PhD uh, in palliative care at King's College London. But today I'm joining from Ethiopia, as mentioned. Nice to meet you. Juliana, you want to go? Yes, good morning. Very impressive. Um, I am a um, student and I am getting my master's degree in global health and uh, my certificate in evolutionary medicine. Um, and I have a lot of interest in obviously global health, um, universal health care, access to all those platforms across um, the board. And so working with Patricia is really exciting and being able to learn from very impressive people such as yourself. So good morning. So thanks, ladies. Uh, this is an impressive, you know, panel because it's ladies. We want to kind of change the world and let's see what we can do uh, towards Ethiopia. I guess it's a gentleman joining us later, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, uh, hopefully he joins us. It's always good to have the voice of, you know, our beautiful allies because we need them. Uh, but I mean, reality is healthcare is driven across the globe highly by women. Let's be honest about that. And that's because, you know, we carry these little things and we care that, you know, we live a world that's great for them if we are not there anymore. And uh, it's something that's noticeable when you sit in any global health discussion. Um, and, and we hope we will have our voice more and more heard. Anyway, Patricia Monte, uh, Sena, you might be the only one not knowing me. Um, I, I, I'm running this company um, uh, from the Netherlands, but we have a global team and have worked on projects across the globe. Big focus on emerging countries because we believe access to care, there's a bigger demand there and it's still greenfield countries. So nothing has been happening for years. And we strongly believe that technology will help leapfrog and make the jump start, uh, a step that uh, the developed world you know, um, I mean, to, to kind of catch up where the developed world is. And this is part of the reason why we're here. So initially connected with Nuamin um, through a podcast, I think, and um, uh, she showed interest. Ethiopia is a country we started doing some work with in the past, but for some reason we had to stop. That was through the embassy, both of Ethiopia in the Netherlands and the Dutch government, because we use diplomacy a lot to do the work that we're doing. Uh, but at a certain point, we had to stop, I think, because of COVID, when COVID started. And thankfully, you Noami know, connected again, and through her, we kind of refreshed all the work we were doing. And beautifully, uh, the World Bank Initiative uh, popped. Uh, Sena, don't know how much you are aware of the, the World Bank Initiative, where they are making available around 300 million uh, euro for either countries. And among either countries, you have Ethiopia. And the idea is any of those countries could put forward a project for them to fund it. I need to add that there is a little caveat. The project can only be requested by the government. So Ministry of Health, any official agency. The other caveat, and we haven't thought about, talked about it, no, I mean, but it's important that we are transparent. We are recording this session. So you're going to get a copy of, of the recording and we can share as well with your colleague if he joins later. Um, as a private company, we are on board mainly to support you or support the ministry through this process. Now, what will happen is decision policies sit at the ministry, contracts between the World Bank will be signed with the responsible person from the ministry or the agency that we will choose. That's an official government uh, uh, organization, but they need both a delivery partner, and that's where Medex kicks in together with you, Nuamin. We will need an official 
let's call that person execution company or organization. There's a list of those among which the WHO. So this is a discussion we need to have later, but I wanted to be transparent about that. And I remember when Juliana started, she was also like, okay, are you guys the one running the whole show? No, we are not running. We are supporting throughout the process because we know it can be very tough for the public sector to you know, keep an eye and, and, and follow through. Um, we submitted all together uh, an expression of interest already. So thanks, Noamin, for all the work and you know getting things across on time. Um, and through that submission, there was an initial idea of what we want to achieve with this project. High level story. It's not a binding document, but it gives it gave a signal to the bank, the World Bank community or the ones driving the project. This is what is upcoming towards uh, from Ethiopia. This is how much budget they feel it will, you know, be all about. And we put a budget of roughly 9 million euro, which we need to fine tune based on the, you know, clarity we will have around the scope, around what we actually want to do and what's the vision behind it. So this first workshop, because the, I think the deadline is 18 of May. So we have one and a half month to go through, I think a few, pages or 100 pages document and be sure about what is that we because we don't always need to do everything we gave an initial view today is about discussing where do we want to go what do we want to focus on who is going to be in charge who is going to drive what who do we want to add extra into the game so we can use that to make the estimate sharper. Here's the reason why scope is critical. So to show that we're capable to actually execute it, but also to be sure that we demand the right amount of money. You can imagine 300 million, I think around 50 or 100 countries all fighting for that. You're not realistic. They're gonna have used that as a reason to kick you out. The next thing that needs to be added about the budget is the World Bank gives only 50% of the money. The other 50% needs to come officially from the execution team. And this is where Medex comes in. Because as a private company, as a delivery company, they said we can also be the one bringing the 50%. So we've been in discussion with the Dutch government already, and they are willing to support us as a company to bring forward that 50% as long as we are the delivery company, official delivery company. So I wanted to tell this full story, partly to show there's still a lot of content discussion and clarity to define there. And then the next step is the process for executing it with the right stakeholder is the other part that needs to be worked on. I know, no, I mean, you're going to tremendously help us because of your network locally, also towards the WHO. Of course, there are many more agencies we can work with, but I have the feeling that we can, you know, we can probably find a, a great entry point due to your background with the WHO. Uh, and as soon as we have a validation from the WHO combined with MedEx, we probably can push this forward and have all the package well prepared prepared and ready for the 18th of May. So when it comes to process and what needs to be done, is it clear for everybody? Do you have any question? It's, it's all clear. Thank you, uh, Patricia. Uh, Sena, yeah. Juliana, questions? Oh, it's clear. It's very clear. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think you did. It. That sounds perfect. Great. I mean, Juliana helped a lot with all of this. <laughs> I need to highlight that. Um, moving into content now. Um, what is important for us, and that's a bit how we wanted to run the workshop. We want each of you, you included, no, I mean, because you know what's happening locally in Ethiopia, uh, to really take us through how do you see the end game? So imagine there is no restriction in money, in timeline, in are we gonna get the money, yes or not? How does this project, the way you've envisioned it, 
how would the end game look like? So if you, Sena, in case you have any idea, if you can take the word, just tell us how that utopia world will look like for such a project. How would you envision it running within Ethiopia or within a specific region? Please share that story. Then we want to hear the same from you, Nuamin. Even if your colleague doesn't happen to show up, it's important that we also hear that story from him later, written or you know, vocally. The reason why it's, it's gonna help us to see if all three of you see the world in the same way, that's first, which will give us a starting point to do a reverse engineering towards how do we get there, yeah? Who wants to start? Dr. Sena, do you want to take the first shot? Thank you so much. So I'll be happy if you can start first, Nohami. Thank you. Yeah, so among us, uh, Dr. Sena and Ermias, uh, who's re representing the Ministry of Health, we were discussing even just before the call. Um, uh, so the, I, I guess the in-game, and I guess tailored to what the call is all about, preparedness for the next pandemic, uh, we, we uh, envision a system, a system within the government that's um, well integrated, uh, starts from the community to the hospitals. Dr. Sena is representing one of the referral hospitals. Uh, so it, I think thinking about medics, we were thinking in terms of health management, HMIS, health man information management system. Uh, so um, a system that's integrated or interoperable. Uh, so uh, patients or individuals coming to primary care uh, centers, we, uh, we should be able to access the, their data in the referral centers or when, when we, when we Okay, I think that's uh, Hermes joining. Uh, hello, Hermes. Let us know if you can hear us and we can do the introduction. Uh, I'm happy if you interrupt me anytime. So in the, uh, when we talked about medics, we were thinking what digital solutions that can help us um, you know, with this da data flow that's, uh, that ensures quality uh, and uh, timeliness. So that's one of the system pre preparedness or response that, that we had in mind. Currently, the gap is uh, that information or data collected in the communities or primary care systems are not uh, flowing to the referral uh, centers or hospitals. Uh, so I think with your sol digital solution, we can uh, easily tackle that problem of um, poor data collection or the data use that, 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 is, that should be actually timely and uh, uh, accurate in, in, term, in times of pandemic. Um, so I think, Patricia, you know that our expertise or my expertise is uh, in palliative care and Dr. Sena is also specialized in rehabilitation. Um, so Hermes just joined me. We are using the ministry uh, conference room in the ministry. I will let, let him say that. So, um, yeah, we, although we specialize in that side of uh, healthcare system, rehabilitation and palliative care, we see a system that's um, uh, from prevention to case management to rehabilitation and palliative care that's uh, uh, quality and uh, reachable, accessible to the community. And we are representing the government health system. We do have private and NGO-based uh, healthcare systems, but the, the gap is much more pronounced and there are inequalities in the even in the uh, uh, government health system. So uh, I think, the, yeah, uh, the, the quality and the equi equity should, you know, uh, is embedded in the, uh, in the story we want to tell uh, in, the health, in the health system we are, we are together creating. So I know uh, maybe it was a fragmented uh, story or the, uh, uh, description of what I want to see, what, what we shared 
uh, amongst ourselves. But I will let Dr. Sena um, complement that and we can go to Hermes. Thank you so much. So, so for especially, let us take my hospital as an example. So we have started the EM, EM system, but the, it is very fragmented. Like we have, we have started for the outpatient, but we don't have for the inpatient because we don't have we do not have enough computers, manpower, and so on. So this problem is everywhere in Ethiopia. So we start initiatives uh, with our own initiatives. We don't have this allocated high budget for this purpose. People are not trained and they don't have office. There are a lot of challenges. So even in the COVID, in the management of COVID, it, it was very difficult. Even if you don't have this system, you cannot communicate clearly the patient case, as Dr. Mohammed mentioned, patient referred from the other side, they will give us just in a line of paper. Accepting paper from a patient is also another risk. So it was very tough. So like this is very important step for us to, to make basement in Ethiopia, especially specifically in Paulus, in St. Paul Hospital. We do have like the number of outpatient cases per day. We see around 2,200 patients per day. But we still we have difficulty of like this having accessing information fully because of the system is not automated. So this is one of the biggest challenges uh, we have in our setup. So addressing this will be a big, big effect, and it will be a big milling stone for preparing ourselves for the next pandemic. Uh, that's uh, what I have all that as a point this matter. Thank you so much. Hey, Jeremy. Can you hear? We can hear you now. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Great to have you with us. Tell us more yeah. about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, nice to meet you. My name is Hermes. If you know the Bible, that is uh, Ethiopian Jeremiah. Oh, nice I see the Ethiopia. link now. <laughs> I see yeah. the link now. Mm. So really, this is a great opportunity for Ethiopia. I'm from medical service in Ministry of Health under medical service lead executive office. There are four desks, the pre-facility and referral service desk. The second one is emergency and critical care desk. The third one is hospital service and diagnostic desk. Mine is the specialty subspecialty service and rehabilitation desk. So at the initiative, this is a good and a great opportunity for us to excel or strengthen the digital, digital information system throughout the country in both public and clinical perspective. So there is a public health perspective, health system delivery outlet and also the facility-based clinical service. So we need we need much more as we are uh, in middle and low income country. So I'm happy to, to hear a good opportunity, good experience as uh, medics and other uh, partners you guys have at hand to share with us. And then we are ready. And we are here to, to plan and uh, to work on it in order to improve our health system delivery. Thank you. 
So thanks, Amy, yes, um, for the, the introduction. Uh, Juliana, you want to do a quick uh, intro again? <laughs> Yes, good morning. Um, I'm Juliana. I am actually located in the United States. Um, I live in Seattle, Washington, right on the Canadian border. And I am a master, I'm getting my master's degree in global health, mm -hmm. as well as a certificate in evolutionary medicine. Um, and it's great to be here. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, Juliana. So I'm yes, I'm uh, running uh, the Medex company, uh, seen best practices from across the globe, got in touch with Noah. I mean, uh, really excited to do the work with you guys. I mean, so much going on in Ethiopia at the moment and uh, such a great opportunity if we can have a breakthrough in the country because that's going to give us an entry into the East uh, African region. Uh, loads happening. The dynamic is changing uh, over there. So we will be absolutely excited if we are capable of you know making a difference uh, as a technology company uh, with Dutch capabilities hopefully with a US capability as well coming into the picture and helping us you know bring that uniqueness and I think the continent has this amazing advantage that we can you know make big steps that uh, infrastructure because a lot of the developed world need an infrastructure with the technology, with the digitalization, we can make we can make big steps. And because we didn't have the infrastructure, we can you know use the the advantage of the fourth industrial revolution to make those steps. And hopefully, we can find one, two, three, four processes where we can show the world that Ethiopia can do great. And uh, from there, go into new uh, territories or maybe use that platform to export in the rest of the region from Ethiopia. So let's explore together, experiment together. Uh, before you join us, and I'm sure you received a copy of our preparation material, loads of work we need to do for one and a half months. Because if you're not diligent on our side, the World Bank will not be willing to give the money. And I was highlighting to both Dr. Sena and Nuamin before you came that we'll need half of that money coming from the Dutch government. Of course, we have other development bank with whom we can talk, because, but because we're a Dutch company, it's going to be a lot easier for us. So if we do our part very well, at least as a company, we can activate whoever needs to be activated. And the luxury we have Juliana in the US, if there's a need to trigger anything from the US, at least we can see together with her how we can have it done and if it's possible. So let's see how far we can go. Uh, before you join Noami and Dr. Sena gave us the vision of, you know, how, how do they envision this project? Where, how far should it go? It's very interesting that up until now, and give, let, allow me to give a bit of a recap of what I've heard. Uh, it's a lot about data structuring, data collection, uh, uh, bringing real-time information to help support decision-making. High level, that's what I've heard, uh, coming back again and again, because you felt the pain of not, there was no touch with patients. And for that reason, there was no, uh, um, history of the patient because we don't have them store in general. In the, uh, I'm sure the, the practice today is people come in, they tell you their story with their own mouth, and then you use that to to build a bit how the future should look like. Or when you touch them, uh, and and COVID was a, 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 a wake up call that hey something needs to be done to make sure that that history is somewhere centralized in a cloud system, preferably because then even if it's there in any village that we can access it. So, uh, uh, yes, we would love from a Ministry of Health point of view to hear your side of the story. I remember that uh, when we submitted the documents, uh, we got a copy of your email saying, hey, we need palliative care being highlighted. So please, this is the time for us to fully hear, again, without constraints. So imagine no problem of money, no problem of timeline, no problem of you know uh, human resources. How would the perfect world look like? And if you can give it to us in detail, it would be great because by the way, we are recording the event uh, and the idea is to get a transcript out of it, which will help all of us because then we can use that story to start building what we need to tell as a story uh, uh, line around this specific project. So feel free to tell us a bit how you 
envision it, how the end game should look like. I hope Dr. Sena joins us back again. Uh, can you hear? Yeah, Dr. Sena is out, I think. She will be back. And as, as I mentioned on the document last time on email, uh, we need to see all experiences from other countries and we need to prepare, we need to exhaust on document of development. So hopefully uh, I and the team, Dr. Sena and Dr. Mohamin will, will prepare uh, these all issues here that you raised really. That is the approach uh, we have to follow. Uh, yeah, the indie game. The end game will uh, exhaust the don't document. But uh, as, as an objective, we need to support uh, palliative care, rehabilitation, other and pandemic uh, issues, as well as uh, the information system, dig digitalizing this. Uh, information system, but uh, also we have other, as I, I mentioned, the medical service department is uh, broad, so we need to consider the public health pandemic uh, uh, preparedness and response phase, uh, case management, and also preparedness for any pandemic. We need to organize that part also. At the same time, uh, the facility-based clinical approach of any pandemic uh, response uh, approach. So we need to focus on both direction uh, related to uh, re-infrastructuring, re the technology, as you mentioned before, the technology, we need to improve our e-data processing. Mm -hmm. so information system should be uh, digitalized. So this is a great chance for us. We will mm -hmm. do that, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh I really see we we are a lot on the digitalization. And one of the things I'm struggling now, I want to take us a bit further down the line. When we were filling in the document of the AOI, uh, Noamin, I'm, I'm sure you can help us here in this part of the discussion. We needed to select areas where we will have focus. So I now get that end game. There's going to be a lot around certain areas that need to be worked on. And I hear end game is full data, full knowledge, information around those different areas, organized in a certain way, ultimately giving us in the whole information man uh, data management thing, we call it wisdom. So at top of it, we'll probably have extreme wisdom. Now I want to take us a bit lower. And when we were filling in the gaps, we said, we wanna focus on early warning surveillance, antimicrobial uh, resistance, the one for use, the network, uh, national diagnostic network, and work for strengthening. Five areas. Is it possible that one of you, if you had time to think about it, tell us again a story, but now on a specific area? How do you see that running for it to help us achieve that end game you all talked about? I can start with the whole human resource. Bit. 
I was on the call earlier with Dr. Sena. We hope she rejoins. Um, so I am doing my PhD in palliative care research. I am focusing on community-based uh, palliative care. And for that project, uh, I needed to see how the referral system works and how uh, human resource or our clinicians at different levels of the healthcare system are interacting and data is flowing across institutions uh, as well as the community. Uh, so there, there is a huge gap in competency and as we mentioned, the flow of data, therefore the quality of service we're giving. So um, if I guess tailoring uh, what I'm saying to the World Bank's call and what, what we hope to uh, focus on as uh, listed just right now, I think if we have a capacity building and element to what we're doing because uh, our community health workers are uh, getting like the very basic or very minimum a few few months training before they go out to provide uh, health prevention this is um, health promotion and disease prevention uh, activities so they in time of covid they were the frontliners they were um responsible in tackling most of the, the, infection, the infections and uh, in fact managing cases uh, as well because uh, our institutions were not well capacitated so uh, patients needed to flow back to the community so if we have elements on capacity building at that level the community health workers level but also um, see how um, technology and uh, a health information management system can assist us in getting uh, patient data flow timely and in a quality manner uh, so that um, uh, we have uh, health, health workers at different levels accessing information, being able to deliver care timely and reducing stress uh, and you know the work burden at, as, as well as uh, you know the, their uh, I don't know, psychological distress as well, because when you have patients, you know nothing about, uh, or like as Dr. Sena was mentioning, data coming on, in paper forms in time of pandemic, there is the loss of uh, information or um, also like the risk, the risk associated with uh, infection uh, transmission. So I think the human uh, resource management or capacity building could be could come at different levels and the digital could help us um, in, in so many ways. Uh, I think like restructuring or uh, modifying the way we, we are handling patient care also uh, will have effects on um, uh, the resilience of the uh, human resource at different levels of the healthcare system. So. Um, yeah, uh, I will let my colleagues reflect uh, on the other areas, uh, or you, know, you and uh, Patricia and uh, Juliana. I, I maybe had a further question on your your the, the topic because the way you see it highlighted on the screen. Can you guys see the jam board? That uh, oh no, oh god! I thought you were seeing the jam board. Um, let me share the screen. Um, I don't know if Juliana is look, uh, seeing it, but not on my end. Can you see the jump board, uh, Juliana? Yeah. It is coming up now. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, good. So what you will see is strengthening workforce, the way it's been organized is at the bottom, and then we have the diagnostic network, resistance and use, and early warnings and surveillance. For us that are technology driven, and ultimately data till wisdom driven, that's a bit how your information is often organized. It's raw till it's you know organized for it to have a meaning on top. Is that, when you were telling the story of the workforce or let's say the community, um, I hear one side of let's use the technology to make them smarter, well aware, well equipped, for when they go to the community. That's one side of the story. 
which I feel is a kind of an input into them as human beings. Do you expect with this project an output? And let me explain what I mean by that. They've learned, they've known, they go into the community, they need to perform things, they see things happening. Do they put it back into the system? If they put it back into the system, what is your ultimate goal of the output process? You know, at the bottom of that element, which is workforce, they've learned, they've had input. What is the output looking like? And how is the output partly helping the community, but partly getting up until the level of either hospital or Ministry of Health, which potentially leads us to the warning of surveillance. Again, I really want to hear the story from you guys. How do you both see that? I think that digital could um, be an input. I hope I, I captured the question right. What or the content we put in the digital could be an input and as an output, uh, depending on how um, uh, long the project would, would last, we could you have like an, an output or them performing uh, the routine task, uh, having, having had the capacity building or like the supportive um, supervision or supportive um, uh, support, through this digital uh, performing their routine. Um, I think in, in the strengthened uh, system. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, if, if we had like a baseline, then maybe through in the project, I'm just imagining if we had a baseline assessment of where they are, then um, the content in the digital or the intervention package in the middle, then as an output, we can evaluate how that has impacted uh, their performance. Um, yeah, so I, I was just imagining, um, I guess the same process uh, for, for my PhD work. I, I, I know Patricia, you're aware that I am um, thinking of digitizing the community uh, palliative care service. So the, where the digital comes in the in this health system, I am still uh, mapping that out with uh, stakeholders. Uh, but the, so uh, yeah, it's just a, a process still in my mind, but uh, what I, where I see the digital uh, fit in the system is uh, as, as a support, uh, the support through, through their routine activities, we could use it um, as a surveillance mechanism, uh, but we can at the same time uh, evaluate their performance at the end of our project. So uh, I think you, you, yeah, using it to influence their work, then evaluating would be uh, a, a good one. But in the digital, we can still, uh, implement new um, process such as uh, like tools to diagnose or like manage cases for I think uh, uh, an example that just came to mind is we have many documents in Ethiopia, uh, the ministry and the regional uh, uh, administration bureau uh, develops many guidelines. So we, we are rich in those but case management or like this is prevention at the community or primary care uh, levels is still um, a struggle. We have, uh, you know, a long, long way to go. And we had a project that assessed why uh, gu these guidelines or documents are not being implemented. And for community health workers who go to homes or schools uh, to teach uh, the, the people at that level, uh, the paper-based um, uh, documents are not handy uh, and our digital health uh, is, is like at its very, very infant, infantile stage. So we can definitely use it um, as an input, I think, uh, but, but, you know, to influence the routine activities and definitely evaluating at the end and like through a qualitative um, study 
looking at it uh, in depth. What does the community uh, think of the system? Uh, where, where do this community health workers see it fit in their routine activities? And how has it influenced our data flow and data use? Uh, I think would be maybe a um, few points we, we can uh, further uh, explore. I hope. Um, yes, do you have any thought, any, you know, anything you kind of expect as a Minister of Health? Because again, I'm, I can imagine when you're presenting, I mean, uh, and, and I'm sure Dr. Um, um, uh, Zena would say the same, when you sit in the middle between people, so community people and the Ministry of Health, you expect a certain level of information for process, at the process level. At the ministry, I would expect that MES, you guys want to see either bigger, broader. Can you tell us a bit the story of when the community does the work? And I can understand I mean, from what I've heard is you sit, you lead the referral and I guess emergency and yeah, the referral and rehabilitation for rehabilitation and speciality. What does it mean for you sitting on top of that? Do you want to see the total country and have the capability to do the surveillance for the total country? Do you, and because Nuamin was presenting it at the community individual level, so the human being. Where do you see the whole picture? Where would it happen? At which broader level? Is it region? Is it city? Is it country? Is it nation? Yeah, thank you. The ministry is a national level. So let me uh, speak on the topics that you shared here, the four uh, thematic areas. Mm -hmm. For example, Ministry of Health in early warning and surveillance for any pandemic or endemic uh, scenarios, we have the ministry branch, uh, any pandemic response unit, EPHI, Ethiopian Public Health Institute. There is an institute under the Ministry of Health. So that is the public health perspective as well as the clinical uh, setup. So in ministry, this is the National Ministry of Health. And then there are the branches, regional health bureaus of 12 regions in Ethiopia. So they will prepare uh, any pandemic response units under their uh, scope. So the national one is this one, EPHI, Ethiopian Public Health Institute. The second one, antimicrobial and resistance, as well as we do have agencies under the Ministry of Health nationally, and then regional level, and then facility. So national diagnostic networking, same. We have agency that uh, Ethiopian pharmaceutical and any medical supplies, supplying service agency, which is responsible for Ministry of Health. So strengthening workforce is also under the Ministry of Health. There is a human resource administration unit and development unit. So as a ministry, you guys, uh, we need you let us, you let you help us on the system strengthening in all level. So we can work on early warning surveillance uh, the preparedness, the current situational analysis, and then how, how we guaranteed the, the well-structured and organized unit for any pandemic response. So there is a system, there is, uh, we are working, we are under construction, of course, it's not perfect, but we are, we have areas that you can, you can act and support on the surveillance and response area. Re related to antimicrobial, also we have the challenges, including uh, antimicrobial resistance and use, as well as other infection prevention tools and reforms. 
So the hierarchy is Ministry of Health is the top one, the national. And then there are a region, same structure to the region. And then there are facilities. These facilities are primary level, secondary, and tertiary. So the one, one of the tertiary level of the hospital that we have is uh, Dr. Senas Paulos Comprehensive Hospital. So this is how, how ministry works. Thank you, Amias. Yes. Um, uh, thanks, Dr. Sena, for joining us back. Uh, we were having a discussion a bit uh, more at the lower level, so you gave us the big vision uh, uh, with what Amias yes, just explained to us. That means you don't sit at the ministry national level. You sit, he said, probably almost at the third layer. Sitting at the third layer, how would you see each of those pillars? So think of you know, a peer doctors around you or as a, probably your hospital manager, how do you see the strengthening of the workforce for your hospital and maybe other uh, 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 hospital around you? How do you see the diagnostic network working uh, and the resistance on antimicrobial? How, what do you notice there and what can be done? We've talked a lot about data, but is data enough to manage this part when we look at you know, what we need to do in terms of the preparedness and how do you manage the, the early warning surveillance? Again, if you could tell us the story more at the hospital level and how you see it functioning, it will help us tremendously probably. Thank you so much. Sorry for, for the interruption because of the poor connection. So I really apologize for that. So this, this uh, as I can see, uh, this is very important pillars for our hospitals, especially like antimicrobial resistance. The same before starting a treatment, we, we give the same medication for all kinds of patients. That is a routine process. We don't test and start. So this will be very helpful for us. And we don't really practice it in our setup for all kinds of patients. You don't go like stepward from, uh, from first generation, second generation, third generation. The, the pattern is like somehow happens. It's not evidence-based. So we need to have this evidence-based way of treating our patient. Maybe the patient need to have to start from the third generation antibiotics, for example. We right away start with the first. And then if it fails, we go to the third. The patient is suffering and uh, it, the patient may die on our hands as we are on trial and error. But if we have this antimicrobial uh, resistance from the primary time, then we can save the patient's life and also the cost burden, everything will be uh, reduced and uh, this will be very important for us. The other is uh, strengthening workforce. As you know, our hospital is it's a tertiary care center. But every kind of patient is coming to us, like the primary care, the second care, and so on. Every care is coming to us. So strengthening this, having this uh, uh, a team to go to that the to the primary side, strengthening that the primary side will reduce the burden to us. So this will be uh, it's a very great milestone for us strengthening those around us, especially strengthening the family medicine and the primary care will be, it's a very important thing. So I really like all the things, so I don't know which one to cast out. The other national diagnostic network, as you said, yeah, uh, there are some gaps even with, um, how accurate our tests are. So having this uh, good tests and also having as uh, having sample as a primary site in order uh, as a comparison site, uh, that would be great. So you asked me before I thought on it. So every step is very important for our setup. And uh, thank you so much. That's all I, I do. 
I do want to ask a bit more on the discussion between primary and tertiary care. It's a big trouble we see in many emerging countries because the healthcare system of the developed world, it also has gaps and challenges. But one of the things they've managed to enforce very well is getting people to realize you first go to your family doctor and it's a family doctor directing you to specialized care. I know there's a lot of effort being done for the emerging globes to reorganize themselves a bit like that. Not because, I mean, a lot of them pay by themselves. I think the system is a bit chaotic in many of our countries because insurance is not covering anything. People need to out of pocket. And when they're out of pocket, they say, okay, I can go wherever I want to go. How do we, because technology can never do that part. How are we going to enforce first either at policy level or at changing the mindset of people because we could organize that in the system. That's absolutely not a problem. Are people going to follow? How do we deal with that first out of the system? Do you have some ideas? Because I, you know, we can always accommodate the technology part, but what is Ethiopia putting in place either at policy level or at mindset change level for people to realize it's better for them to first go to their family doctor or to a, a GP before coming to you, uh, Dr. Sena? Yeah, so as a family physician, we are like, uh, we are pioneers of family medicine and we have been fighting for that. And the number of family physicians in Ethiopia they are very low in number and almost there are 16 numbers, those who are graduated, the maximum number. So uh, addressing that, uh, it will be difficult, but through time we can do that. But we do have other, like we use as a primary contact persons like uh, the HO, we say health officers, health extension workers as a gate entry into the health system. So we use them, but they are, like at the very primary level and they cannot, uh, they are not very good one at detecting this the early warning, the red signs and the patients will be missed. And uh, we do have to strengthen. What I recommend is strengthening this family medicine, this uh, teaching more family physicians and also sending out from the tertiary center to these areas to teach, to give them some training is, to support them, to strengthen them will be very important. So this will be very good step in strengthening our primary health care and also to, uh, to, to have like the real tertiary care center uh, for us, strengthening the other um, uh, health, uh, health workers will be very important and working with them in collaboration with the other uh, healthy workforce is very important. Thank so thanks, doc thanks, Dr. Sena, for your answer. I want to bring you into this discussion, no, I mean, um, when, look, what, I, what we're seeing happening across the globe is trying to get people as much out of the healthcare system as possible, into prevention, as much as possible. And for me, I'm tying it now to the community you highlighted. How does the community that's, you know, community health workers that are built, you were talking about that you're looking into, at least on the palliative care, how can they play a critical role together with all the health officers that Dr. Sena was highlighting? Because we don't have enough family doctors. We, I mean, there is no other way. Can we mix that with self-care management? Can we trust the Ethiopians if we give, put in their hand things to do self-care by themselves? Can a mix of both help in, you know, moving a lot of Ethiopians into the, how do you call it, into the um, prevention space? So the, 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 the Dr. Sena piece of the game is not overloaded. How do you see that happening, uh, Noamine? Yeah, thank you, Patricia. So Ethiopia actually is known for uh, the health extension program. Uh, which is the community-based uh, health promotion disease prevention uh, program that started a few years back, like 20 years back, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so we do have a strong... Uh, so 
there's an opportunity in the primary and community healthcare system, as Dr. Sena mentioned, uh, because we have uh, various uh, health workforce, uh, starting from the uh, minim like minimally trained community health workers to clinical nurses, uh, health officers, uh, and family uh, physicians, and GPs also, because we have GP general practice who, who haven't done a family medicine training, specialty training. So we do have GPs uh, uh, there. So we can use this uh, uh, as an opportunity uh, to uh, capitalize on primary health care and community-based uh, care. And uh, the role of this clinic clinicians or community health, health workers so far has been uh, focused on prevention, but more, mainly in acute infectious illnesses like malaria, diarrhea, uh, and so on. So um, with the shifting uh, epidemiology in our country and in most developing countries uh, with NCDs and chronic illnesses uh, rising, we, we, we should, of course, uh, use this similar uh, health workforce to uh, capacitate uh, uh, there as well as the community's um, uh, preven prevention or self-care in uh, chronic illnesses like hypertension, di diabetes, and uh, even, you know, screening and prevention of cancers uh, because that, that uh, those illnesses are also rising in our country. So um, there is an opportunity uh, and um, like a lot, a lot still needs to be done in the community for self care. Uh, we often joke when we are together among colleagues that even us doctors do not do screening for cervical cancer, for example. So there, there, there's a lot that that should be done in the community. But for this project, we can focus on community health workers and the varied primary care workers that, that are already um, many in number. So the, the number is there. We can use that, that uh, capital, uh, but we need to capacitate. Uh, and the digital is going to help a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just uh, uh, re-thinking uh, about it as Dr. Steiner was mentioning, because we don't have uh, data flowing across uh, community and the institutions, but it, you know the many, um, good work that is being done in the community is not being captured at higher levels. So it's like duplication, replication of efforts at various levels, uh, but it's not um, synergized to uh, result in uh, quality health care. So I think our project can build upon that. Thank you. You're muted, Patricia. Here. All right. Yeah. So I'm back. Um, uh, Juliana, I don't know if you have any questions so far, because I can keep going. <laughs> Taking it all in. Yes. Please keep going. <laughs> good. Good. Um, at least on my side, the process is clear. Understand nationwide. Understand tertiary care perspective. Understand primary care perspective understand there's loads of work to be done. Also, we need to be realistic. And that's now a question to all three of you again, where do we start? Where do we start in a realistic way so we can show that we are so good for us after this success, we can have the trust for either Medex as a company or the World Bank to see, this is a great example. We can give extra cash to do further area. Do we start with palliative care? Do we start with malaria only? Do We can do it all. Where do we start? I leave the floor to, to one of you to just, or we can have an open discussion and come to a conclusion. Yeah, uh, I, I was trying to plug in uh, as my 
battery is running down. So, uh, Dr. Sena, Hermes, please uh, feel free uh, to start, then I can supplement. Dr. Sena. Yeah, so for me, like, uh, so our hospital is one of the biggest hospitals in Ethiopia. There are two big hospitals in Ethiopia. One is Blackline Hospital, the other one is uh, St. Paul Hospital. So starting at uh, our hospital, which is uh, tertiary care center, is uh, I think it will be an idea so that we can take it as a model uh, especially this starting with this digitalization, this is the EMR system. If we can like start with it and also we stretch out to our referral, uh, our referral catchment areas, the health centers, the hospitals. So will be an ideal so that we can take this as a model site and expand it to other uh, hospitals in Ethiopia. And I think starting with our hospital, with maybe uh, uh, with uh, one of like the neglected areas like uh, rehabilitation and palliative care is almost neglected and uh, didn't get any focus. So, which is very important at this time, by this time, because the number of NCD is increasing and uh, people are becoming disabled because of their problem, because of CA and uh, Uncommunicable diseases. So, starting with this and then expanding to other places will be, I think, will be an ideal for me that I can share others' idea and I, I can share your ideas too. Thank you so much. Yeah, I agree with what Dr. Sena said. Uh, I think palliative care and rehabilitation. Um, is where we can show our impact uh, because the current practice is a very, very minimum. And we can definitely uh, use that as an opportunity as uh, as we have been describing uh, community health or primary health care clinicians uh, are best fit to, to practice the, such service because they are very close to the community. That's where our patients are because in our institutions uh, do very little uh, in those areas and uh, patients come at advanced stage. So we send them back home uh, and the, yeah, the inequality also is so huge. Patient, people who can afford the care go to private settings, NGOs, um, and access the care, but those who, who are uh, the very least privileged are uh, left alone, basically, um, if lucky with social support, but often uh, the, it's very demedicalized. Uh, so we can bring in evidence from region, our uh, East African regions. Uh, we ha they have very good examples of uh, implementing palliative care. Um, so we can bring examples uh, that we can replicate in our context. Uh, and I think it's going to be, uh, I don't know, what, what makes us stand out, what makes the project stand out, because we have so little uh, in, in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Sena and Dr. Nohamin, let, let me add some, for example, Rehab is broad. Uh, Ethiopia is currently uh, on era of post-war, as you, all you know. Do you know that? Yeah, so the backlog is high in Ethiopia, so we need a uh, much amount of uh, roster sort of service, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and other uh, standards. So currently the standardized service is uh, not yet here in Ethiopia. It's not mm -hmm. applicable. So we are uh, in the uh, partnership mapping phase. So 
we need to stress on rehabilitation, also the palliative care uh, for the selected facilities. There is some, some uh, uh, emerging palliative care service, but for others under palliative care, only the physical, uh, physical pain uh, management uh, approach. So we need to stress on both as the backlog is high and also the uh, disease shift, uh, public health importance is yes, uh, leading us to, to, to focus on palliative care and rehabilitation. Also, we have other uh, specialty and subspecialty areas we need to focus on. Uh, for example, like uh, the forensic medicine, forensic psychiatry, the new emerging uh, scholars here in Ethiopia. So uh, if, if we, we decide to start with these two palliative care and rehabilitation, we will do on other specialty and subspecialty areas, as well as the advocacy and uh, health education is also, as you mentioned before, that is the public health, uh, public uh, level or household level or primary. When we say primary health unit, there is a primary hospital, there is health center and health post in rural scenario. At Arban, only primary hospital and primary uh, health center. Yeah, this is our approach. So we need to also uh, think on health education and uh, uh, data management for better decision making. Thank you. I, I, I love this discussion because I'm, it's, it's very interesting that the continent is realizing that that is so critical. I mean, we can't do without data. We, we need to eat it and live it and decide based on that. I want to go deeper into the whole scope discussion. Palliative rehabilitation, these are the two topics popping. We also understand that endgame is wisdom in those spaces. Where does palliative start? Now, let me explain. NCDs, non-rare disease, and then someone realize end of life. Is it when that NCD plus rare disease is, you know, uh, diagnosized, then you get into the palliative process? How does it look like in, in, in Ethiopia? Or is it, okay, it's a complicated disease, there's nothing in place at the hospital, go home and we'll follow you from home where there is mental, physical, and a bit of spiritual element to be dealt with, but remotely. And what I hear from Emias is the physical piece of it. There's a rehabilitation process where we have centers for it. And there there's a rehabilitation piece that will be dealt with. Is this how you understand it? And where does it start? Where does it end? Is it people dying? Is it people feeling better, recovering, uh, being able to be taken care by the GP? Please tell us a bit the story there. We are arguing who takes the floor. Uh, I'll start and let him uh, compliment. So um, we, I think we cannot localize where we should be pro providing palliative care, but of course we can definitely discuss where we should start or where our, our project would start. I personally have few projects at the community level, primary health care level, and at the referral health center level. And I have practiced uh, palliative care at the referral center. So uh, following where we are in Ethiopia and following how we started, we there was a hub and spoke approach where we targeted the hospitals, referral center hospitals, to be the hub for trained human resource and uh, where morphine, the essential medications uh, of uh, palliative care could be accessed. And the hubs uh, were, sorry, the uh, spoke or the 
uh, peripheral accessible sites were the primary health care centers. Um, so for, I guess building upon where we started, we, we can use hospitals uh, as one of the entry points uh, to access palliative care patients uh, because our um, preventive care is still um, uh, poor. We can, we, we can imagine that uh, the patient load uh, or where we can easily access our patients is at these referral centers because patients uh, present late uh, with poor, poor diagnostic capacity in the primary healthcare centers. So uh, one of the projects, uh, research projects I had was, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, was looking at palliative care service at the primary healthcare centers. And to your surprise, we couldn't find a, patient, a palliative care patient at that center. Yeah, so our patients are pushed up the uh, level, the healthcare level. So they are sent for diagnostic purposes. Uh, they are sent for management, but often the cases they cannot follow a uh, curative or disease modifying uh, treatment options. So they are uh, on the palliative care, but our palliative care capacity still at this referral centers. Uh, is uh, still developing. So because of lack of capacity, we, we send them back home, often without support. So we can use these referral centers uh, as settings where we identify patients or you know, can easily access patients uh, for the project, but our patients are often sent back home. So the community is where our intervention should uh, exist parallelly uh, you know uh, as it it should in the institutions so in the community that because i am also considering it for my phd project what can we do or where, where does palliative care start i think we have re-emphasized time and again that the capacity of this community health workers is still poor so we need to train them how to identify palliative care needs. They have very mi minimal uh, knowledge from their uh, undergraduate studies. Undergraduate curriculums do not have palli palliative care content still now. So they don't know the approach. They have varied skill sets. So we can imagine they, they can identify some physical needs. Um, and of course, you know, because in Ethiopia, the, the, the social support is rich. They can offer social support uh, themselves or, or organize the social uh, capacity that, that's within the community. So we can help them identify palliative care need uh, using a standard measures. Those are not in place right now. So we can introduce that and the digital also can help us capture that need accurately and it can be a checklist that they can readily uh, use as, as they go to patient homes or uh, schools, you know, where, wherever uh, these needs are. Because uh, uh, even at homes, we may not uh, find uh, the, the huge burden, Ethiopia being uh, a religious country, our people uh, tend to be in the religious um, places. We have holy waters and church and mosques where patients at um, advanced stage where institutions or the healthcare is not supporting their needs uh, tend to go to. So uh, we can train community health workers to be able to identify needs and to the minimum, make appropriate links. And these links uh, should be, and uh, you know, depending on the scope of this project, uh, should include the spiritual, social, and psychological support. Thank you. I can uh, pass over to my colleagues or um, you, Patricia, for any questions. Are you there, Dr. Sena? Yeah, this is how how ministry play a role. Yeah, so I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. 
सेना आई थिंक दैट इज बिकॉज ऑफ इंटरनेट डॉक्टर सेना ओके लेट मी प्रोसीड डॉक्टर नोहमिन एड्रेस ऑलमोस्ट ऑल बट लेट मी एड सम सो रिगार्डिंग द पैलेटिव केयर डॉक्टर नोहमिन मेंशन सो वी हैव फैसिलिटीज एज मेन होस्ट फैसिलिटी एंड आल्सो हब as a hub we we mapping uh, we started to map the health centers so we we need to uh, map for both host and hub facilities throughout the country uh, we need uh, to develop a kind of guidelines and standard documents so we we need to prepare uh, implementation supporting strategies like uh, training packages for health workforce uh, in case of rehabilitation we need to think and work on uh, capacity building as well as uh, experience sharing of uh, uh, at least similar with ethiopia so so that we can we can uh, scale up those experiences here in ethiopia and also we need to think on how, how can we solve the problems for consumables and uh, machineries in both new and and the repairing the existing machineries should be uh, supported so we we need to support the machineries especially in prosthesis and orthosis because as i mentioned before we are uh, on the era of post war so the backlog is high so we need both palliative care and rehabilitation so we will work uh, in this manner Uh, now dr sena is here if if you have any idea you can add yeah so my idea is about uh, palliative care so as a tertiary care center there, there are a lot of referrals to our hospital but when we their treatment they will follow for one or two session and and then they will disappear and there is no one like to follow them and they will be very far from our setup and uh, it's very painful you know if, even if even if they have this like they have good spiritual support the social support but their pain is not controlled many of our patients and uh, they will die with the pain and that's very painful actually our palliative target is not addressed as a country as i can say, i can say that so this strengthening the connection training those at the community level health extension and this uh, linkage uh, and also uh, supporting this the the lower the hospital regional hospital uh, as extension and so on will be a great input for our uh, our effort otherwise if the patient dies with uh, pain then such so as must done and uh, we didn't reach the target so uh, targeting palliative care it's untouched and the menu surprisingly all almost all of our patients they need palliative care and we only consider palliative care whenever they are only stage 4 not set up and uh, this is not the right thing to do palliative care should start from the beginning of the care and uh, i think uh, we have to work hard uh, on this to meet our millennium goal and so on so that's it. thank you so thanks thanks all three for the insight it, it gives loads of perspective um when you were talking as a technologist 
we can bring you some of the smartest AI to do the triage. And, you know, you wouldn't even need the community health workers, maybe just to direct them and, you know, and check and serve as support. But is the, the community or let's say the people, can they actually use the technology? And let me tell you the story around that. Senegal, with them, we were working on a million dollar project. Let's give, um, uh, in French, in France, they call it CMU. It's like, uh, it's a type of insurance, but it's government insurance. They gave it to people, I think between 50 to 70. You could get access to it. You could go to any hospital. So we were supposed to map the hospital and they could find it. Them would get the card. No one would use it. They wouldn't use it. They wouldn't do anything with it. And in technology, we call it, so technology often isn't the biggest issue. All you were describing, I can tell you, you give my team two to three months, we build all of it, all of it autom uh, uh, automated. How is the engagement gonna be? Are they gonna use it if we deploy? Or can we, are we honest with ourselves and we say our people, if we go, extremely automated, it's not gonna work because they are not yet there. Let's do flavor of automation and flavor needs the actual people. And let me explain further what I mean. We also work with a French organization uh, that does into cancer for kids. And what they were explaining to us before we needed to do the implementation is the money is available, uh, we were supposed to build a kind of a screening within the, the, the technology for the parents, wherever they are in the targeted countries, if the kids get something they suspect could be cancer, they will fill in, the signal will be given, will show them the hospital close to them where they could get, you know, access to, uh, how do you call it, support. Almost 20% of the people that will do the screening, they would actually go there the first time. And now I bring the story that Dr. Sena highlighted. After the first, second time, none of them would show up. And I'm saying free, fully free. What we observe over time is, because we have to recognize it on the continent, spirituality is a critical element. A lot of them feel like modern medicine, it's their thing. We know their thing, what we mean, and traditional is our thing. Now I'm pushing a bit the button very far, but I want us to have that discussion. So either we see how to embed it into the process and in the documentation as part of risk and how we're going to mitigate that risk, because I think it's going to make the World Bank and all those financiers at ease that we know different things that could pop. How do you envision we need to address either extensive technology or shall we Google light technology because the people cannot really deal with it yet? Can we trust? Now I'm gonna give you another idea. Within our digital hospital, we have what we call family care. And the whole concept of family care is we know on the continent, we often rely on each other. So we, we said, okay, let's assume in a family, Parents don't know how to use technology, but their sons, their daughter know how to. She will serve as that linking pin to do the whole management, even if they're at home. Is this an approach that could work? Would the community health worker play that role for all people in the neighborhood? Uh, these are ways for us to mitigate some of those challenges, because if we put the money, we build a super technology, and no one uses it, it's also a loss for all of us. Now, I just wanna hear your perspective. How do you see that uh, in Ethiopia? I'm sure it's already pretty advanced in Ethiopia in terms of adoption of technology. Uh, we know across the globe, when we talk healthcare and technology, let me be honest with you, even in the Netherlands, people are not, uh, they don't trust technology when it comes to healthcare. So how do you see that? Uh, and this is more an engagement adoption question. I can start. Uh, so, because that, that was one of my concerns and what I am trying to explore uh, in my project. Um, if I may start with digital literacy, 
so the government who is one of the community has information system that's uh, being run centrally with the Ministry of Health and Partners um, has done work on digital literacy for community health workers. And uh, the uptake um, is uh, very, very well. It's very, it's huge. Uh, and I think part of the reason is because uh, this community health workers are uh, responsible to collect data and transfer it uh, to the uh, to the central server. Uh, they are it's one it's their responsibility. But what I have learned through the process is uh, it needs to be one what something we we take we they are accountable for. Uh, there have been phases in this uh, transition from the work-based, um, sorry, paper-based uh, data collection and transfer uh, to this digital digitalization. And if we do both, they're going to drop the digital, most likely. Uh, so the, the transition has to be um, a short one. And we have to capacitate uh, the digital literacy early on, uh, of course, you know, through uh, scientific and, you know, engaging the, them through the process and our intervention. Uh, sorry, MS wants me to send a message. He, he needs to report to his boss very briefly and he will come back. Uh, so we do need to build it but the, the the positive thing is the community health workers are literate enough to uh, you, you know get get engaged with the technology early on so uh, don't lose hope there is the, there there will be engagement but we have to um, have an accountability mechanism uh, uh, and one of the reasons i engaged the ministry for my PhD project is without the engagement of the ministry or like a high level um, accountability mechanism, we ca we we can't force them to use this digital or any any uh, uh, I guess mechanism to control or uh, even support uh, the community health workers because there are uh, you know million reasons for them not to use it. Uh, and we want to support when we do the project or like uh, when we support in general, we want to engage uh, them in a way that, you know, they feel comfortable and trust what we're bringing in is going to support, not be a burden. Uh, so the, I think building upon what you said, Patricia, uh, we have to keep um, in line with the value of the the community uh, our 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 community wants that personal touch so we don't want to replace uh, the the what what's going on with too much digitization um, so we we need to balance what we need to use the, the digital for and uh, where the, the human personal touch comes in especially for our palliative care patients we do want to supplement and not replace. Uh, and yeah, the I think the, the lessons learned regionally, inter globally, is we want the digital in, in, in a society such as ours to complement. And we, yeah, that, that will help us uh, build trust as well, because we are being considerate of what the society values. Um, with the transition, I want to reemphasize that we don't want them to be doing both because that creates so much uh, work burden uh, and we do lose the quality of uh, what we want to gain and, of course, the effectiveness of our intervention. So I think that's how we can mi mini minimize the risk. Um, and I think for our initial pilot, we want the community health workers to be using the digital. Uh, you know, should, I think most of our intervention would have a digital component. That's why I'm using that term uh, because uh, I think it's one one of the evidences is that uh, in low resource countries, the literacy level of the community, uh, as you were mentioning, because of 
many reasons, but uh, majorly because of the level of literacy, uh, households might, might not be a reliable uh, target group uh, for our initial pilot. So you targeting uh, community health workers um, would be a, a feasible uh, plan for our project. Uh, definitely the family-based technology would work, but uh, I, I won't want to maybe side more on using the community health workers. We can um, track the, their performance and, you know, they, they would be uh, engaged through the, to engage with the project through the accountability mechanism we can uh, implement. But the family, that would be tricky. And maybe uh, because of the, differences uh, at different levels we, we may we may not find it maybe applicable uh, in all um, areas so yeah i will pass over to dr so thank you so much uh, dr Nahamin, and uh, thank you for your I think she got internet problem again. Yeah, Patricia, we can go to you. Yes, I think. sure. Um, well, on my side, to be honest, covered almost everything. Um, Juliana, I don't know if you have any other question topic. Of course, we need to do the wrap up and check how do we move in terms of process um, to, to submit so everything. My comments are oh, yeah. We worked in this very slowly, slowly, slowly. Oops. So sorry for the condition today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, so we have one thing. We, I think we have to start very slowly. When we start with the most, the highest the technology, there will not be anyone that tries to cope up. So slowly, slowly engaging people. And also what I recommend is the, even the digitalization has, the test has to be an Ethiopian test, you know? Yeah. People yeah. easily accept it, like the figures uh, and so on. So the test and the way we do things, it has to be in the test of an Ethiopian culture. So people will, will accept it. So family-based is good, but we can start with a health center or healthy extension workers. And then when the advancement comes, we can shift to the family. That's, that's my comment. Just thank you so much. Great input, uh, Dr. Sena. Thanks again. Juliana, any other question at content level before we move into process? No, I think that um, one of the most important things with the application process is covering a lot of what the World Bank is looking for from Ethiopia. And I think that a lot of the things we've covered today has really targeted some of those components, such as impacting communities that are le less represented. That seems to be one of the big areas within the application that they're really looking for, and also utilizing pre-existing health systems prior instead of, I guess, reworking the entire system. They're really wanting to utilize um, community health workers, people already in place, um, and then enhancing and how we can enhance those processes. So being able to start small and then scale up from there, I think is something that we would probably have um, good success in when filling out the application and really utilizing those types of processes to show that it's not just this large project it's really beginning at the lower levels and you can see the vig the vision from beginning to end um so i think that that it seems like that whole process is there and that's something that's going to fit in exactly with what the application is looking for so thank you 
Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Juliana. I think you actually gave the, the wrap up and I love that you could be that I knowing as well what uh, uh, they're looking for. Uh, it, it brings us into, you know, the, the purpose of today was, are we all aligned? We love the fact that you talk to each other, you connected with us, seems like, you know, it's in line with also based on the, the input of today, Juliana, that what the World Bank is looking for. We can always contact them if we are not sure. That's also what they said, have them on the phone. Um, now we need to get into actual work. The content will be structured. So we are gonna extract everything we discuss, put it on you know words, structure it, make it available so you don't have to rewrite a lot of things. And you have to do part of the work now, which is we have, I think it's 50 pages, Juliana, if I'm not mistaken. The document was made available to you guys. Please spend some time. Like we said, video will be there. Written story from this video will be there to help you. You go as far as possible. And I suggest we have a weekly checkpoint to, to see where are you? Do you have challenges? Can we do something on our side? Meanwhile, on our side, what we need to trigger is make sure the 50% money is gonna be made available because we have to convince the World Bank that either the execution team, and there I need your help, you know what I mean? Probably through the WHO, can we get their commitment? Can we get their commitment to be part of this? You explain to them that we're still working and figuring out how far the scope will go, but if they can accept to be part of this, then MedEx teams up with the WHO for the delivery part while we are putting together the story. And then I can engage the discussion with the Dutch Development Bank. So when I hear what we discuss, I think we are not going to go up to the 9 million we requested initially, because you know, with my project views and face and understanding of technology, I think we're going to end up lower. Also, like Juliana mentioned, it is important that we be sure we can do it and do it very well. So let's scope, focus, either pick a new area or region as a starting point I can promise you, if we can show success, finding the money to roll out in the rest of the country will not be, I promise you, it's not gonna be the biggest challenge. But if we go too big, too fast, partly, even if we get the money, we might you know, not succeed at the end. And for all of us, it's not gonna be good. Instead of being realistic, picking a right scope, doing it absolutely well with class and excellence and use that as a platform to show this is needed for the rest of the country or for other areas. Uh, because I also strongly feel like the palliative care will not be a big space. I know we need to look into rehabilitation, uh, uh, MS, I know it. I'm a bit worried about rehabilitation into the whole game. Why? Because rehabilitation tends to be very physical activities and physical projects. So we have to figure out where it's going to fit into the whole scope. And if there is a point to include it at this stage, um, but that should be part of, let's bring it into the picture. If you are okay, we plan a weekly meeting of an hour to see how we're progressing. Where do we have challenges? Do we need to trigger anyone? Do we need a discussion among ourselves? Uh, and we will try to organize it on our side so you can really focus on content. How do you see, you know, these are high level what I've heard. Juliana shared also her thought uh, based on, you know, you are on track in terms of the topic you want to address, the way you want to address it. Do you feel comfortable that we move forward, that we meet on a weekly base uh, and that you will do your part in, in gathering the input and structuring the documentation? Um, but on a weekly base, we'll do a check and we need to onboard someone from the WHO as soon as possible. WHO Ethiopia, because if it was global, I would trigger the headquarter uh, in, uh, in, in Geneva. We need someone from Ethiopia. Thoughts, ideas? 
Yeah, thank you, Patricia and Juliana. Um, yeah, uh, well summarized. So uh, we are uh, all on the same page, on the same page. Uh, yeah, and yes, the weekly, I think, meeting is going to help us. Uh, Dr. Sena and Ermias are super, super busy with uh, the Ministry of Health Activities and uh, Dr. Sena being a provost at the her hospital and of course me was my PhD but so the weekly meetings will I think help us uh, be orga more organized and um, share thoughts also and like check in uh, that our deliverables are going to be timely for the May uh, submission mm -hmm. so agree 